Stairway to Freedom, Chapter 5, The Concept of Peace. The history of mankind is one long record of war and bloodshed. The history of the animal kingdom is a tale of life being taken by violence in order to preserve the stronger of any two animals. We say that nature is red in tooth and claw. What we mean is that some creatures live by being carnivorous, and thus the dramatic way in which they obtain nourishment captures our imagination. In fact, the vast majority of nature lives by peaceful means. Virtually the whole of the plant kingdom and most of the animal kingdom kingdom lives by obtaining nutrients without killing in the accepted sense. However, the imagination of man is captivated by the gory details concerning the hunting methods of the relatively few creatures that are carnivorous. Nature and one cannot really accept as true the saying that it is red in tooth and claw. It is the imagination of man that fits that description. In his disembodied states, the creature that becomes man on earth lives without killing. He does not need food. Energy is ingested directly through the auras. And because of the nature of the elements of auras, it is not possible to take the life of a fellow man or an animal. Thus, the concept of killing is limited to the planet Earth and to man and animals in physical form. However, hatred is a condition not limited to the Earth. It is possible for hatred to exist by man dressed in his bodies of light and indeed there is at least one area of life that has in association with it the conditions necessary to promote hatred to the full and those who wish to experience that degree of anti-love are attracted to that area. Of course, as with all emotions that do not correspond to love, the individuals attracted to that area will ultimately turn once satiated and reject the concept of hatred in order to find love. Commensurate with hatred lives fear. Fear and hatred go hand in glove, as do peace and love, and are in fact the complement, the opposite of each other. Neither are gifts of the Spirit. They are attributes towards which man strives. They are not natural to man either. He is not born with the concepts of fear and hatred within him. They were unknown to him before he incarnated to earth and they will eventually leave him once he returns home to the spiritual realms. Whence comes the almost universal feelings of hatred and fear so deeply entrenched within the heart of man? Hatred is a concept unknown to the animal kingdom. They, animals, do not have the capacity to hate, and yet they have the capacity to love. Who could deny that a dog has love for his mentor, known to us as his master? Certainly, there are vicious individuals incarnate who abuse and ill-treat their pets in the most appalling manner, and those pets fear their master, but they never hate. It would be a sad day if that concept were introduced into animal consciousness. Therefore, let us recapitulate and say that fear and hatred within the auras of humans go together that fear is known exclusively to animals, initially, and that hatred is known exclusively to man. Thus it is that they come together on earth. They are encouraged and introduced to man by the complement of the directors of life, the archangels whom we, we might term the directors of chaos. 
The function of the directors of chaos is essential to the ongoingness of life, but once they have free reign, then their effect is evil indeed. So it is that an insidious force is fed into man's heart to cause the greatest degree of separateness from the concept of God possible. God stands for peace, love, beauty and togetherness. The opposite is war, hatred, ugliness and separation. At the root of these negative concepts is fear. Fear will separate one group from another and cause one man to attempt to kill another in case he is first killed. Fear is at the heart of distrust, causes barriers to be built, and will ensure that nothing positive can be achieved. And yet, fear is an alien concept to man. It exists only in animal life. An examination of a human being reveals two creatures in one. His true larger self is entirely spiritual in nature. Man can be compared to an iceberg in the sense that that which is visible to the naked eye represents but a portion of the totality of an iceberg. With man, he has one physical body visible to the naked eye and seven auras invisible to that eye. He also has a soul and a spirit of God. Therefore, If seven-eighths of man is spiritual in concept and knows no fear naturally, how is it that the body can hold such sway over his entirety? The simple answer is that because with most people the auras are undeveloped, thus they do not operate effectively, and so the human physical body represents a large part of the makeup of a man. Thus it is that fear can be introduced and hold sway over his emotions. However, if and when that person begins through prayer, meditation and devotion to God to develop his auras, it must be obvious that such concept of fear must be reduced because developed auras full of the power of God know nothing of the emotion fear. Thus, the totality of fear in relation to the totality that becomes man reduces. Simple, isn't it? Why then is the vast majority of mankind held in the grip of fear and hatred? The answer, of course, is that knowledge of man's auras, knowledge of the techniques of meditation, have been kept from man by those in the grip of the power of evil, because such power recognises instantly that knowledge of such matters would sound the death knoll for that power, and the power of evil, like the power of good, is forever striving to gain supremacy. Therefore, we have the sad concepts that throughout the world the techniques of meditation are ascribed to fringe religions not applicable to us. That prayer is formalized and emasculated into ritual chanting that touches neither mind nor heart and that the auras are considered to be figments of the imagination of misguided souls one step removed from the lunatic asylum. The result is manifest in war and crime, unhappiness and decay of the elements of beauty inherent in man. The situation will continue until the climate is altered so that individuals are aware of the auras surrounding them and of the desperate need to develop them. It is of paramount importance also to equate in the mind the concept of freedom in relation to evil. Whilst it is fairly easy for most intelligent people to comprehend that those who are squarely at one with God may be permitted latitude in relation to liberty of action, and that once we know them and trust them that they will always act in a godly manner, we can relax our vigil over them, set them free to go and act out their existence as they will without causing us any distress, the same cannot be said for those individuals used by the forces of evil. Which of us can accept 
that any evil person has the right to act in an evil antisocial manner, causing unhappiness in those areas in which he operates, and still be at peace with the concept of allowing him so to act. And who amongst us would be able to comprehend that he has the right so to do? Teachings from most religious publications exhort, on one hand, the turning of the other cheek in relation to acts perpetrated by misguided souls and, at the same time, exhort us to deal with those ensnared with the forces of evil. We are encouraged to drive out the devil from the souls of those in his grip, to exorcise people and, in short, to take action to remove the devil and his power from people as far as we can. Is this action valid? Does not the devil have a right to exist if we consider that he too must have been created by God? Does anybody acting in an antisocial manner not have the right so to do? What should the position taken by a true disciple be? Well, in an ideal world there would be no antisocial acts and the devil would not exist. We state at once that such a condition will never obtain because it, it is not part of God's master plan of life to be. The concept of the opposite of God was created by God and is an essential part of God's creation. Without the negative forces, there will be no world, no people. Nothing could exist without yin and yang, the opposing forces to which we must strive to achieve a balance. Once again, we find that generations of souls throughout the world have been misguided by the orthodox religions and by philosophers who really should have been able to accumulate sufficient information so as to arrive at the truth. But they have not. And so we are in a position of trying to re-educate mature souls who consider that complete domination and vanquishing of the negative forces would create a Garden of Eden. Such is not the case. We must always have the forces opposing each other. This is because the forces of good and evil act automatically and blindly. We do not wish to offend the sensibilities of those who visualize God as a man with a white beard and those who assume that God must be infinitely wise, but we feel obliged to present the truth. God was represented with human attributes by those who realized that simple man could not comprehend an abstract force. It is only recently that man has begun to comprehend and quantify the nature of gravity. So can you imagine if an angelic being had suggested to those living long years ago that it was necessary to obey certain rules, but the creators of those rules was a blind force? Probably there are whole communities today who could not or will not recognize such truth. However, it matters not. We present the truth as we see it and as we know it in our hearts so to be, and we permit anyone who disagrees the latitude so to do. The power of God is a force that pulls towards the concept of creativity in all its variation quite automatically and without ceasing. Should there be no opposing force, then chaos would obtain. Matter would combine together endlessly until the universe was full of one enormous planet. Any life force in the nature of plants and animals would live and never die, would procreate until the surface of the planet was choked with living things. In short, life as we know it could not be. So we need the negative force to limit the power of good, to slow down the rate of growth of reproduction. 
The power of evil acts as the dustman, the undertaker of life, disposing of the dead and dying, so making way for the next generation. Like the power of God, the power of evil acts quite automatically and without ceasing. If there was no power of God, then chaos would ensue in the opposite direction. Life would die out. Planets would decompose into their constituent parts and life would cease. Therefore, we hope that you can understand that life is a balance on a knife edge between the two opposing forces. The problem is that unless action is taken constantly by those on the side of good, the power of corruption quickly gains the upper hand. Imagine a house standing anywhere on the surface of the earth. Once built, it begins to decay, and the owners of the house have a constant duty to repaint the wood, repoint the brickwork, repair the roof, etc., or within a short space of time, nature reduces it to rubble. That is not malign. It is the natural negative force unconsciously at work ensuring the breakdown of all that is. That is its function and it performs it well. The workers for the power of good may be likened to the owner of the house. He has constantly to work just to repair the damage wrought by nature. Should he wish to improve the house in terms of making it larger or more beautiful, he has to put in still more effort, and then that requires even greater effort to keep it in pristine condition. From that example, you can see why from time to time great spirits like Jesus come to earth to exalt all who will understand, all who will listen, to take up the fight against evil. We hope you can understand why you too must take up the fight. To return to the point originally under discussion, should we prevent any person from acting for the negative forces? Can we answer such a question and yet answer it we must in order to help clarify our position in relation to the pull of opposing forces. We could take the point of view that we should kill any person acting in an antisocial manner, and yet, instinctively, we know this to be wrong. But why is it? It would solve the problem by removing from the face of the earth any person acting in an antisocial manner and projecting them into an area of the spirit world where they might cause distress to those of like mind to them, but would not offend more elevated souls. But our duty to God and man must always be positive. The act of killing is a negative force, and therefore comes under the jurisdiction of the devil. Therefore, should we kill, we act for the devil, and by definition, in opposition to God. Similarly, if we imprison or punish, torture or maim, we are acting for the force of evil. So the miscreants go free and still walk the earth and still cause distress to those whom they contact. Can we do nothing to ameliorate the situation? I am afraid that the answer is no in a physical sense. We must not touch them. However, all is not lost. We have on our side the power of God, which may be magnified to any required degree through the trinity of prayer, meditation and devotion to God. That power may be unleashed against those harming us and our fellow man. It is done in the following manner. Sit down quietly Visualize the individual and or the cause that is damaging to peace in the world. Then pray to God in simple language for that person or that organization to be helped by God. When you have finished, thank God for the power that has been sent to ameliorate the situation. Did Jesus not ask you to pray for your enemies? We ask you to do the same. 
Having placed those enemies in God's hands, you must leave them there. Do not carry out any action to restrict them. The power of God will enter their hearts and will reduce the action of the power of evil, and so their antisocial actions will reduce. By a similar process, the actions of the controllers of power in the world may be modified. Those of whom we spoke earlier, who act in the capacity of judges, politicians, educationalists, trade unionists, etc., and who effectively are in a position to be manipulated by the negative force, can have that action reduced and changed for the benefit of all. The task, of course, is monumental. People held in the grip of an evil force will not lightly be released by that force. The task of prizing evil out and goodness in can be imagined by those on the side of good. The numbers of people acting for the power of good through the action of prayer and meditation is very small compared to the numbers held in the sway of evil. But, nevertheless, a start has to be made somewhere. The start was made many years ago by the first prophets and wise men to incarnate. And there is a vast army of souls discarnate who pray constantly for peace. Therefore, when you join us in prayer for peace, you will be joining a mighty throng. Do not feel isolated. You might be the only one in your house or in your street, and yet you join in automatically with the minds of those incarnate throughout the world and those discarnate in the spiritual realms who, like you, pray for peace. The power of God is sent winging on its way to enter the hearts of those who sleep and waken them to the reality of life and truth. Do not be dismayed by the stories appearing in your newspapers. They merely tell of the actions of those who have not yet been won over to the side of good. The newspapers do not mention those who do not commit crime because the power of God resides within their hearts. Soon the time will come when, when man will see the crimes committed by those who control them. The worm will turn. At such times it will be natural for those newly enlightened to seek revenge themselves for the long years of suffering wrought on them by the few who held power. There must be no revenge. Let God deal with the perpetrators of those crimes as he will deal with the perpetrators of all crime. Do not allow the peace within your hearts to be disturbed by thoughts of revenge. You would only be acting to strengthen the hand of the force of evil. Act always for God in peace and love. Then, by your example, may all learn to follow the path of peace. Within the context of a study of the human aura, mention was made of force fields surrounding an individual which we term auras. These force fields are pure energy, pure life, and as such may respond to the total energy or life force being emitted from a person through his emotions. Therefore, it is noted that the auras may change colour, but much more importantly, any individual reacting to the environment surrounding him will be raising or lowering the vibration rate of those auras and thereby transmitting or absorbing energy. Those who are influenced by the dark forces are used to manipulate people and situations to create an atmosphere of dismay, despondency and despair. The effect, obviously, is to succeed in reducing the vibration rate of your auras as they respond to the vibrations surrounding them. They reduce in value and in hue, and matter is reabsorbed into those auras, and that allows a process of destruction to occur. The result may be an accident, a fire, an earthquake, 
It depends upon many things, but you may be sure that if you feel depressed, you will be contributing to your own downfall and also to the downfall of others. Similarly, any of the Antichrist emotions, greed, jealousy, hatred, envy, etc., will produce negative results and will affect life both close to you and maybe far away as you reduce slightly the total energy for creation that is available. It must be clear then that each and every person, incarnate and discarnate, must strive to be happy, cheerful and to be full of the positive Christ-like emotions of peace, love, understanding, compassion, etc. The result will be an increase in the total energy available for the world to be at peace. Then accidents, hatreds, wars and other upsets will reduce. The problem, of course, is how to be at peace in a world where we are surrounded by negative forces. For a start, you will not be at peace if you identify with the things of the earth. The satanic forces influence the minds of many who work in areas of advertising and management to create within society a feeling of lacking. It is a condition resulting in one trying to keep up with the Joneses. The situation is manufactured to make you feel that you are in some way missing out on that which you should have as a result of the effort that you have put into life. Why should you have an old car when all around you appear to change theirs every year? Why should you stay at home each summer when your friends, or enemies perhaps, travel to exotic places in the fruitless search for fulfilment. We could go on to include houses, household appliances, clothes, employment prospects. The list is endless. New areas of creating dissatisfaction are being explored continuously. The effect, of course, is manifest and manifold. The vast amount of resources in terms of oil timber, metals and oxygen that are consumed to create the objects of desire. The vast amount of suffering by those who design, manufacture and sell these often needless articles. The incredible amount of envy generated by those unable to obtain the goods and the awful disappointment when the effects being finally obtained and on realising that they were not needed at all, are shoddy in quality and do not create lasting happiness and contentment. The degree that the dark forces advance by such practice is awesome. The counter-attack must be complete rejection of the materialistic way of life. If you need a reliable vehicle, then purchase one and make sure that it is a solid well-built vehicle and resolve to keep it for many years. If you need a holiday, then seek out a peaceful retreat in a quiet country area and relax. If you need a house, then purchase one that you can afford and live in it in peace. Reject this chaotic way of life and you will find contentment within yourself that no amount of chasing after rainbows will bring you. Do not worry about promotion at your employment. Serve your fellow man as best you can and leave your employers to chase their fortunes. Do not act in concert with them. They are lost and do not know where they are going. In fact, they go nowhere. Leave them to be like dogs chasing their tails and walk the road to God in peace and tranquility. Meditate every day. Pray every day. Serve God by serving your fellow man. Have respect for the Spirit of God inherent in every atom of everything that you use. Do not discard old clothes merely to buy new ones. The same Spirit of God is in both. Do not discard vehicles to buy new ones. The Spirit of God is in both equally. Serve God 
manifest in all that you have and try to be at peace with what you have. By doing so, you will change from the lost soul that you may be now to the Son of God that is your destiny. Find peace within your heart. Keep peace within your life. Show peace upon your countenance and be sure that when people look at you, they will be looking upon the face of God. That is the end of chapter 5.